we've got a very large panel and we've got a long session, we've got an hour and a quarter, but I do want to get through it so that there's time for discussion at the end. So Megan is going to kick this off. Megan is from Exodus, from Exodus Travels, and she's going to recount a story which puts the rest of the session in context. So Megan, welcome. So hi, my name is Megan. I'm the Responsible Tourism Manager at Exodus Travels. We are a UK-based outbound adventure tour operator. Um, so I was asked by Harold to speak today, not because I am in any way an expert on human trafficking or modern slavery whatsoever, unlike my fellow panel members here. Um, I was asked to talk because I was recently involved in an incident that I think highlights why we're sort of all here today and hopefully what we can do about it. Um, I hope that through listening to what happened, um, you'll all think collectively what we can individually do as travellers, but all what we can also all do as members of the tourist industry to raise awareness of a problem that we could and should all probably be doing more about. So, um, I recently boarded a flight from um, Malaysia to London. It was an overnight flight. I was seated next to a pair, uh, a fairly elderly man and a woman um, or girl a lot younger than him. Um, as it was a 30-hour flight, I thought, I'd just say hello, break the ice, and, and just ask how she was. So I, I asked her, how are you, the girl I was sitting next to. She replied and said, uh, I am fine, and looked terrified uh, and didn't want to talk to me. So I quickly realised she wasn't relaxed in, in any way at all. Um, later on in the flight, I noticed that she was still wearing a heavy winter coat and her uh, big boots, and you know, really hadn't moved for most of the flight. Um, and even though the cabin was very hot, it all felt very odd. Uh, I also noticed that every time she went to the toilet, or he went to the toilet, they'd always go together. Uh, if, he always, if he wanted to go, she had to go with him. So on one such occasion, I decided to also leave my seat and went to the cabin, uh, went to the toilet behind them, and saw her on her own, and she was waiting for him to come out of the toilet, and I asked again, how are you? Uh, she said, I am fine. Uh, I, more flustered than this, really. I am fine. I am visiting my family in Leicester. I am with my uncle. And she was kind of muddled and then looked away. Uh, and I said, is this your uncle you're with? And she said, yes, yes, my uncle. So we sat down again. The lights went down. Um, blankets came out. At that point, her uncle uh, was touching her under the blanket. She was trying to move away. She was very distressed. Um, uh, her uncle, um, when we were close to boarding, uh, close to landing, um, produced two passports out of his bag. One was his, a British passport, one was hers, a brand new Malaysian passport. Um, and he proceeded to talk her through what would happen in immigration. So, you know, tell her that there would be two queues, they'd be in separate queues, where to meet him, um, and what to say. And he made her repeat the line about visiting her family in Leicester over and over again. And if she muddled it, he became particularly aggressive. Um, and, you know, this was all quite quiet, but obviously I was listening. Um, so at this point, I decided to go and speak to the cabin crew, um, told them what had happened, and said, could you or should you please arrange? I, said, I didn't say I think anybody's being trafficked, but I just said there's a situation that isn't right. Could you arrange for somebody to meet the pair off, the, off at the other end when we land? They said no. Uh, and I said, uh, really? You, nothing you're going to do? And they said, no, there's, there, we won't do anything. And I said, okay, can I speak to a senior member? So I spoke to a senior member of cabin crew. Explained again what had happened. Um, asked again if they could arrange for somebody to meet. Uh, again, was greeted with no. Uh, and I said, I, you know, I don't believe it. Surely you have had some training yourself. Or surely you have a policy in place to know what to do in a situation like this. Again, they said no. Um, <laughs> The only assistance they offered me was they said, if you're really worried about the girl, do you want us to just check in and see if she's okay and ask if she's all right? And I said, no, absolutely not. You know, I think you'll make the situation a lot worse. Um, so um, we landed, I stayed close to the, to the pair. I pointed them out um, upon arrival to a board of security um, personnel. Um, later on, they gave an official statement uh, was told that the girl was almost certainly travelling against her own will and um, the guy was a nightclub owner in Leicester. Um, she wouldn't be allowed in the country and uh, he was being investigated. So I, th 
think really this is my sort of short story today. I think what we need to do collectively is think what we can all do as individual travellers, but also as every arm of the industry. We could and should be doing more. We should be more aware. We should be global citizens. We should be more engaged. Um, I mean, to me, it's fairly clear that initially there is this uh, pervasive can really only be addressed by a collective action. Um, so on to that, I'd like to pass you over to the real expert panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Megan. So Jenny, complete with prop, I notice, and in uniform. Splendid to see you. Um, hi everyone, thank you for having me here. My name is Jenny Stevenson and I work for Border Force. Um, and I was brought here today by Harold and he gave me the question or the, the title of what Border Force would want the industry to do and the travel industry that is. And so I'm here to talk about what Border Force do in the area of modern slavery, how we do it, the challenges that we face and what the travel industry can do for us to help us to help us overcome those challenges and, and avoid the situations that Megan um, came across just then. And before I go into who we are and what we do, I do want to make it clear that I'm speaking to you today as members of the travel industry, as travel professionals, as travellers, but also as members of British society. Modern slavery is out there. We know. We've seen it in the Evening Standard. If anybody gets um, transport from London. Um, and we've all got a part to play in its eradication. I, as you can imagine, have an official part to play. You can probably spot me in the panel. But I'm also a member of British Society, so I'm sort of reaching out to you to say, act responsibly in your professional lives and also your personal lives. So back to Border Force, having said that. Um, who are Border Force and what do we do? You've probably seen us as you're passing through the airport. We look at passports and we're in the, the customs channels. Um, our kind of official strap line is that we are a professional law enforcement command within the Home Office, responsible for securing the UK border and controlling migration at ports and airports across the UK. We deal with goods and people crossing the border, both legally and on occasions illegally. And that puts us in a unique situation because we see everybody that crosses the border. And that includes victims of modern slavery, victims of human trafficking. And I've only got a few minutes to tell you what we do in the area of human trafficking. Um, and so I can't tell you everything, but hopefully I will give you some tools to help us along the way. The UK has a protection system called the National Referral Mechanism, which when our victims of modern slavery are identified, they're given protection under UK law, they're accommodated and they're given help to rebuild their lives and also to prosecute the traffickers. Border Force are first responders in the National Referral Mechanism, the NRM. So what should have happened for Megan is that the airline should have got in contact with the first responder in the UK, Border Force on this occasion, could also be the police, and the first responder would take forward the action to protect that victim. Luckily, I think it did happen. But it, it took until she got to London, to the airport, and it took her to kind of make her way through the crowd and make herself known. So, what do we need to do as Border Force? We need to identify the victims, and we need to put in place that protection by referral to the, the NRM. So identifying victims, that's quite easy. No, it's not actually, because most victims who cross the border, at the point when they cross the border, they might not even know that they're a victim. They'll be promised a, a fantastic job in the UK, they'll be promised that when you come to the UK, I'm your boyfriend, I'm going to look after you. Megan's, um, the person that Megan saw was actually displaying signs of being frightened and intimidated. A lot of the victims are not frightened at that stage because they don't actually know what they're going into. So what Border Force do and what all the first responders do is we use indicators that we look for um, to try and see who is a victim of modern slavery, who could potentially be vulnerable to exploitation. It may well be somebody that appears scared, as Megan saw, it might be somebody who's got irregular documentation. Um, use, the use of forged 
passport is, is a classic trait of somebody who's being trafficked. People want to move people around easily. They want to avoid visa regimes. They will make them use a forged European passport, a forged British passport. Another indicator is that people who don't know what they're going to do in the UK, they've got a very poor cover story. And you note from Megan's story that the man was drilling into this young girl. You're coming to see your family. I'm your uncle. Don't deviate from that story. So sometimes the stories are very fragile. And it just common sense things, like somebody who says they're alone, but looks over their shoulder quite frequently. And so we will be looking at people's behavior as they're approaching our immigration controls and passing through our border controls. There are many, many, many other indicators, and we look out for them all the time. But what we're really looking for are things that don't fit. When something looks a little bit odd, a little bit out of kilter, and I'll put the question to you now, probably a, quite an obvious one. Is there anything a bit odd here? The Mimi, the Mimi of coffee you're carrying. It could be that you've got a border force officer, officer in full uniform carrying a Disney toy. Um, this is quite an obvious demonstration of an indicator and also an intelligence profile that we are actually still using. And just to, to let you know what the circumstances of Minnie Mouse, it isn't humorous, although she does prove the point. This Minnie Mouse was in the hands of a young lady of Eastern European origin. I think it's about four or five months ago. She was coming through the border. She's European, she's part of the EEA. She can pass through the border under the, the, um, the laws for the EEA. But the officer said to her, oh, why are you carrying a Disney toy? She wasn't coming from Paris. She wasn't on a Eurostar from Euro Disney. And at that point, her cover story fell apart. And to cut a long story short, she was somebody who was being brought to the UK to work in the sex industry. And since we noticed this young lady carrying the Disney toy, we've seen this kind of Disney toy in the hands of young Eastern European girls at various airports. And most recently, two weeks ago, there was a big teddy bear in the hands of a 15-year-old girl coming through a ferry port at Calais. And so that's sort of a blunt demonstration that modern slavery is happening and the indicators are out there and we need to, to work hard to get them. But reach out to you guys. We can't do this alone. We look for our indicators and I can't give you a training course on indicators today, but you can be our eyes and ears. And Megan did exactly that. She was our eyes and ears. And what I'd like to say is, if you do spot something that you are not happy about, you can contact Border Force and you should be able to, to go to the travel company that you're with and they will have the mechanisms to contact Border Force. And if you are from a travel company, train your staff to make those referrals. I have with me today a training tool, which is a, a short e-learning. I've got about 20 or 25 that people can take away if they can use them in their company. This is based on the home office e-learning, which is the, the first level of training for, for officers. And it just tells you about the indicators and how to spot them and the referral to make. I'm not saying you should be first responders and able to refer into the, the NRM, but it just tells you if you see something that you're not happy with, contact Border Force. And I do just want to end on a happier note than Megan's experience. Megan saw something she didn't like and the company wouldn't do anything. Just recently, 10 days ago, somebody disclosed that their family member was overseas and was the victim of modern slavery and was going to be subject to exploitation when they returned to the UK. That was passed on to us. We were able to meet that flight and I'm glad to say that that person is now in the National Referral Mechanism. So that system has been put in place and works, but it relies on companies training their staff and being willing to. So the question at the start was what would Border Force want from the travel industry? Train your staff will help you to do that and enable them to make those referrals into Border Force or any of the other first responders. So thank you very much for having me.
Thanks very much indeed, Jimmy. Martin, I think you're next. Martin Prudax from Lumos. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Prudax and I work for Lumos. Lumos is an international organisation established by J.K. Rowling with a mission to end the institutionalisation of children globally. What I mean by institutionalisation, for the most part, is children growing up in orphanages around the world. Now, one of the main factors that contribute towards children living in orphanages, particularly in low-income countries, is that they have actually been trafficked, those orphanages. And I'm going to come on to tell you a little bit about that in a moment. I want to start off, though, with the big picture. What do we mean by trafficking? What do we mean by slavery? Slavery means uh, people who are forced to work under threat or coercion, people who are owned or controlled as a commodity, people who have had their freedom of movement restricted in some way or stopped in some way. There's some recent figures that have been, that have been released by the International Labour Organization which suggest that there are over 40 million slaves in the world today. About 10 million of these slaves are children. The vast majority of people living in slavery around the world are in Asia and Africa, including many countries which are destination points for tourists, where the travel industry is very active. Um, about 67% of people in slavery are in forced, um, forced labour, so um, areas such as working in the manufacturing industry, the construction industry, uh, domestic servitude, forced beggary, all areas which can cross over with the travel industry. About 70% of people living in slavery, that's one seven percent, are, in, are living in conditions of forced sexual exploitation. That includes both adult and child sex tourism. So this very much crosses over with people working in the, in the travel industry and the travel industry infrastructure. I want to focus in now on the area of trafficking and slavery which my organisation works on, which is to do with orphanages, what we commonly refer to as orphanage trafficking. So orphanage trafficking is a phenomenon that exists in a lot of low-income countries where there is a strong tourism industry, or in some cases where there's a strong connection with the faith community, where there's a lot of Christian organisations supporting orphanages as well. But you'll see that uh, the orphanage business operating in countries like Kenya, Cambodia, Nepal, Myanmar, Thailand, and many other countries as well. Those are some of the most well-documented countries where this phenomenon exists, though. The way the orphanage business works, the way orphanage trafficking works, is that brokers or traffickers target poor, rural, usually uneducated families who are living in poverty, are facing all sorts of hardship in their lives. And they go to those families and say, we can see how tough your life is. We know you want more for your children. If you pay us some money, or sometimes for free, they'll offer these services for free, we'll take your child, uh, we'll take them to a good boarding school in, uh, in the city, where they'll get a good education, they'll get a better material quality of living, they'll be looked after for many years, and then they can come back years later to the family, to the village, where they'll have a good job, they'll be educated, they'll have all these, um, all these things which are considered good things, and then they can look after the family in old age. Now, as far as the families are concerned, why not? This is a great opportunity. So the families agree, and they'll often pay money for this service, thinking they're acting in the best interest of the children. When the children get the, the so-called boarding school, it turns out to be an orphanage where the children are told that they have to pretend that they're orphans or they have to pretend they're from destitute families and they have no other option other than to live in this orphanage. 80% of children around the world living in orphanages are not in fact orphans. That's a fact. Um, most of those, all of those children, eight, all of those 80% of children have one or both parents alive. Even the kids that are not that are genuine orphans with the right support could be living with brothers, sisters, grandparents, cousins and so on. The vast majority of children in the world don't need to be living in orphanages. But once they're in these orphanages, they're then used as poverty commodities. They're used as fundraising tools to try and attract donations from tourists, 
from volunteers who were encouraged to come and visit the orphanage, sometimes for a few hours to see the children, give them gifts, play with them, sometimes for months. Uh, this is supported by uh, a niche area of the tourism industry, the volunteering industry, uh, that sends volunteers to these orphanages. Again, in most cases, with good intentions, thinking they're helping genuine orphans uh, who have no other choice than to live in these orphanages. And um, they give financial donations to, to the orphanage. They give gifts, they give money. So for the orphanages and the traffickers involved in this business, there's a lot of money to be made. There's money to be made from well-intentioned but naive um, families who give up their children, thinking they're acting in their best interests, and well-intentioned but naive foreign tourists, volunteers, and volunteering companies that think, that think they're doing something good by sending volunteers to help these children. It's a lot of money to be made from this business. Now, one of the um, questions that was asked in the blurb for this presentation, um, for this workshop, was why don't more people raise concerns? Why don't more people do something about this? Well, in relation to some, an area of slavery like child sex tourism, for example, it's much more black and white. Most reasonable people realize that's completely unethical. Um, it's a black and white issue. They, realize, they understand the line that they're crossing if they engage in that practice. But volunteering in an orphanage, sending money to an orphanage, sending volunteers to an orphanage, it's not so black and white. Unfortunately, most people still think this is a good thing. They still think they're helping by sending volunteers to an orphanage, sending money to an orphanage. They don't realize the link with trafficking, the link with slavery. There are some really good examples, which I want to talk about briefly, of um, organizations which are doing something about this. One of those examples is an organization called Friends International. They run a scheme called Child Safe. Friends International work in 11 different countries in Europe and in Asia. They have some fantastic campaigns like this one in the picture here of a group of Cambodian children in a glass box with um, tourists taking photographs of the children, demonstrating these children are being kept in a, effectively a zoo for the amusement and the entertainment and the, the tourism of, um, of the travelers that come to see them. Friends International also run a, a Child Safe Citizens campaign uh, where they have trained about 8,000 um, agents of change who are trained in child protection, including 4,900 people working in the tourism industry, in hotels, taxi drivers, people in restaurants who are trained to look out for the signs, look out for problems, and talk to tourists about these, about these issues. So that's a really good example of where the travel industry is doing something about this. They also provide bespoke solutions to people in the travel industry, advising them what to do, how they can improve their child protection procedures and so on. Another example is an organisation in Nepal called Next Generation Nepal, who I used to work for, so I'm biased, so I'll, I'll admit that. Um, they run a series of talks in Tamil, in Kathmandu, the tourist area of Kathmandu, in a pub, where they give talks to tourists about issues around child trafficking, around orphanages, uh, and people give talks from the tourism industry. The good companies that have changed have stopped orphanage volunteering talk about why they don't offer opportunities in orphanages um, to help tourists understand. And indeed, many other local travel providers, tour providers, come along to these meetings and learn about these problems for the first time. It's a friendly environment, it's not too much pressure. I think it's also worth saying some really good news we've just heard today is that Projects Abroad, one of the big, biggest volunteering companies, have announced that they're going to be stopping orphanage volunteering placements, which is fantastic news. It follows on from more recent news that World Challenge, another big volunteering company, have stopped orphanage volunteering placements. So the tide is turning, the tipping point has come. So if any of you are offering volunteering placements, like, really think about this. And there's many of us that would be in the child protection sector who would be happy to talk to you and happy to work with you on this. This is a partnership. We're not against you, we're with you. We need to work together with solving these problems. Unfortunately, though, the problem still exists. If you Google, um, I'm picking on Nepal here because it's the country I know best. If you Google volunteer Nepal, this is what comes up. Opportunities to volunteer in orphanages. Even if you've not thought about volunteering in an orphanage, you just wanted to volunteer, you wanted to have some sort of cultural interaction during your holiday, the idea of volunteering in an orphanage still comes up. It's one of the first things that's suggested to you. They put the idea in your mind. This is something we have to change. 
if you're not that organized, if you go to a place like Kathmandu, you go around the restaurants, you go around the hotels, you'll see notices like this one here advertising for foreigners to come and work in orphanages and also there they'll be asked to make donations and so on. So this is what we have to change. This is what we need to do. And I do think that the tourism um, industry, the travel industry, has a lot of power to change this through airlines, through hotels, through transport, uh, through advertising, uh, through marketing materials. There's huge potential to change this. Speaking as someone who comes from the child protection sector, we're limited in what we can do. We can give technical advice, I can give talks like this, but ultimately the change has got to come from within the travel industry itself. So that would be my heartfelt plea to you today, to go away, think about this, and if you can make a change, you can come to us. I work for LUMOS, uh, it's L-U-M-O-S, the Save the Children here, there's Friends International here, they're here somewhere. Uh, there's a number of Hope and Home to Children, there's another fantastic organisation doing work in this area. There's lots of us. Harold will be happy to share the details if you want to contact us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca Armstrong from Responsible Tourism Matters. Um, I'd like to look today at the, the political and legal aspects of um, tourism and modern slavery and trafficking, and really taking a risk perspective. So are we as an industry turning a blind eye to these risks? They're uncomfortable issues and are we sweeping them under the carpet and not really um, raising them enough. So what are the risks? Um, well, I'd just like to say that they exist here in the UK, they exist overseas, they exist in developed countries and developing countries. They're very closely related to the uh, tourism and hospitality industries. And I'd like to make a point for the outset really that none of them really look like the image on this slide that might be what springs to mind when we think about slavery. Um, as the speakers before me have said, um, it has a very modern face. It could be debt bondage, it could be um, forced labour, um, all, all different aspects. And, and in very complex ways, um, those, those issues crop up in tourism. So in the limited time we've got today, I'd just like to explore uh, the issue a little bit by focusing on two areas. One is the, the first is uh, the area that Martin has uh, touched on, and that's, that's deliberate really that we're um, following, following on from what Martin has talked about. So as he explained, the phenomenon of orphanage tourism is creating a demand for orphanages and therefore a demand for orphans, um, and that's fueling the crime of, of orphanage trafficking. And from a legal perspective, there's been some work, um, some excellent work in Australia, for example, by a lawyer called Kate Van Dor, who's um, explained and argued uh, very convincingly how that, that, that type of trafficking fits with international definitions of the criminal offence of, of trafficking and exploitation. Um, and her work has resulted in, um, for the first time, this kind of trafficking being recognised in the US Trafficking in Persons Report, um, which is a really significant milestone in just getting international recognition for this issue. Um, in Australia, um, the government in Australia is currently considering its own modern slavery legislation um, and a recommendation has been made to the government by the subcommittee um, that the uh, orphanage trafficking should be specifically included in that legislation. Um, back in the UK, we had a round table meeting at the House of Lords a couple of weeks ago um, and that brought together a good cross-section of representatives from government bodies, uh, tourism, the tourism industry, NGOs, uh, UK High Commissions, um, it was under the Chatham House rule that we, so I can't uh, uh, particularly report the discussion in detail, but we, we agreed to some, some real concrete action, um, including awareness raising and prompting action at industry level, um, so that's at policy level, uh, ensuring that trips and excursions don't include visits to or volunteering at orphanages, but also practical steps like working with supplier hotels, for example, to make sure that they're not encouraging their guests um, independently to go off and visit local orphanages educating tourists, um, whether they're package tourists, whether they're backpackers, whether they're gap year volunteers um, at different points of their journey, so uh, right from the point where they, they want to volunteer through to guidebooks, through to travel media, uh, advice by the FCA, obviously work with Border Force, um, and then also the sort of legislative and political response, so just looking at how we can really capture these, these offences and make sure that they are covered by the legislation that offenders can be brought to justice. Um, and it's, it's just a real imperative for us as an industry I think, to recognise this, this, this issue. Um, we may not be directly involved in it, but our, if our industry is, is fueling this awful practice, I think there's a moral imperative for us to step up and, and address it. Um, and then secondly, I'm just focusing back on the UK, really just because it's an example of where there is modern slavery legislation at the moment, but we will, we will start to see this more and more around the world. So for example, as I mentioned, Australia is 
is introducing its own modern saving legislation at the moment. In the UK, uh, the operational risks for the tourism and hospitality industries are really twofold. So it's liability for offences and the reporting requirements. So those offences, again, fall into two parts. So they can be slavery, servitude, forced or compulsory labour, or human trafficking with a view to that person being exploited. And this affects workers and suppliers principally, if you think about the hospitality industry in particular. Um, workers, I've used that term deliberately, not employees, so those people may not be directly employed by hotels or by tourism companies, but they are the moral and ethical and ultimately potentially legal responsibility of those, those hotels. Um, and the supply chains as well, again in the, in the tourism industry and the hospitality industry, those, those supply chains are long and complex. Um, and that, that is another reason really to be rigorous in how we address those issues. Um, I just wanted to highlight the, uh, the point about whether a company ought to know. There's a provision in the legislation that if a, if a person ought to know that slavery or trafficking is occurring, then there may be liability there. And that, it, it's early days and the days of the legislation, it's only two years old. And there is no case law on this, but I think it's, those words must be included for a reason, and included so that we can't turn a blind eye to it. If you ought to know that slavery is happening in your supply chains, then you are at risk. Um, and a recent report found that the hotel sector is at heightened risk. Um, the Gang Masters and Labour, Labour Abuse Authority um, has recently had increased powers, and in the, the five months since those powers were increased, um, it's opened over 200 new investigations, including um, some into hotels. Um, sorry, I'm losing my notes. Um, and then the second uh, operational risk for, for tourism and hospitality companies is the reporting requirements. If they have a turnover of over £36 million, they must report on the steps they've taken in the last year to ensure that there is no slavery or human trafficking in any of its supply chains, or make a statement it's, made, it, it, it's taken no such steps, um, which is obviously not a comfortable position to be in. Um, there's a debate at the moment um, on whether the legislation should go further. Um, the requirement is to report, not necessarily to act. Um, the government position on that is that they want to encourage compliance through public scrutiny, public pressure, um, whereas there are campaigning bodies who point out that actually about half of the companies who are required to report have not reported, and that most of the 100, uh, FTSE 100 companies um, have adopted a tick box approach to reporting. So there's clearly a lot more to be done. Um, the House of Lords has introduced a bill um, looking at whether the, the, the legislation should go further. Um, campaigning bodies um, point out that scrutiny of reporting is very difficult, that we should have new legislation going further, for example, to limit the number of layers in a supply chain, um, or to make firms jointly liable for any slavery um, or exploitation of workers in their supply chain. So there's, there's a debate going on, the pressure is not going to go away. Um, so a responsible industry, respo a, a responsible industry response um, really just to, to encourage you to really look at your business model, um, particularly the hospitality business model marked by outsourcing, low wages, um, look for indicators that are specific to the industry, know your workers and supply chain, this is something that um, my, uh, the speakers following me will, will go into in more detail, show action and progress, hold others to account, if you're doing really well, um, shout about it, tell it, show what we're doing and encourage a, a more responsible response by, by others in our industry. Thank you. My name is Alexander Spalaskiewicz and I'm uh, from the University of West London. Uh, a few years ago I was privileged to gain funding from the European Commission and uh, lead a research team, a consortium of universities and NGOs to uh, investigate uh, human trafficking in the hospitality industry in Europe. It was a two-year project and uh, the purpose of this project is to come up with uh, that's me, come up with a training toolkit for the hotel industry in particular uh, which was not about awareness, mere aware, raising awareness but uh, go one step further and propose action at corporate, senior management, and operational uh, level. So, training toolkit two years later done. Uh, all these are the elements, and you can find them. You can find this uh, training toolkit uh, in several websites. Uh, one of which uh, I think Nishma later will talk about. 
the Stop the Slavery uh, Hospitality Industry Network. Uh, so, available for free. But uh, talking about the extent of human trafficking in the hospitality industry, uh, as John Schwartzberg said in the previous panel, everything is political. When we started in 2014, nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to hear about it. There were actually only seven cases reported in UK about human trafficking in the hotel industry. Uh, amazingly, when we started this project, uh, we found that uh, everyone had a story to say. So what we found out and we estimated in the end through our research is that a moderate estimate uh, of slaves in Europe in the hospitality industry would be about 115,000 people. Uh, believe me, this is a very moderate estimate. I would say that double of them would be okay. Types of trafficking that were ident was identified was CSE, child sexual exploitation, forced prostitution, uh, forced criminality, uh, forced modern labor, and uh, other panelists will talk about those uh, in a minute. But what I would like to uh, bring your attention to is not only this is happening, but who are doing this? And who do we have to deal with? These are criminals that take advantage of every loop possible, of every vulnerability in our industry in order to make money. And they will take advantage of every little hole that is available in order to achieve their purpose. Normally, you associate uh, human trafficking with rafts of uh, rafts of uh, refugees being transferred from uh, uh, Asia or from Africa across the Mediterranean to Europe. Uh, it's far more than that. You know that it takes just one passport and a reservation in a hotel, which cannot can be. Uh, not be honored, so just have the proof of a reservation in order to get a visa. And many people are being transferred like this, trafficked like this. And I'm going to give, I'm rushing because I have to rush, but I'm going to give you two examples of trafficking which are quite unusual. Okay, you all have in your mind sexual exploitation in the rooms, or maybe outsource staff, uh, you know, uh, housekeeping staff or gardening staff being exploited, or construction workers being exploited. Here we are talking about two cases, as you can see them. One is Carla, a receptionist, and she could look like this, and the other one is Justina, and she is working in the staff cafeteria. Both of them hired, went through the normal recruitment process in hotels, five-star hotels at this point. Carla uh, was receptionist, very secluded, very isolated. She was not socializing, working long hours, uh, sitting in the cafeteria alone when she had a break always with a large appetite uh, for food, but never talking to anybody, didn't have a mobile phone, wasn't talking about anything, no family or anything like that. Six months down the line, she was arrested because what she was doing was every guest that was coming in the hotel without a reservation, she would check in and uh, register him as a guest coming from a specific travel agency so that the travel agency can uh, take commission for this guest. She would also change guests that were having the reservations uh, through the normal channels but she would register them as coming again from this 
specific travel agency so that the travel agency would get the permission. Of course, the travel agency belongs to her traffickers. This lady was hired without uh, human resources perhaps paying too much attention in her details uh, and she was brought every morning with a van and picked up every evening or at the end of her shift by the same van for six months and she was a trafficking victim. Similarly, Justina was hired as uh, the person who would serve in the staff cafeteria uh, in the hotel. Uh, the other staff. Very nice, about three months down the line, there is an opening in the accounting department, uh, in accounts receivable. And uh, Justina produces all the evidence that she has, you know, university degree, she's a registered accountant, and she can apply for this job. And successfully, of course, because the hotel wants to show that we are promoting within, they give her this job. Uh, accidentally, someone says, well, maybe we should check again her passport and everything. And uh, it was found out that her passport was fake. And that actually triggered an alarm. Justina was there in order to get the opportunity to get to accounting or to front office so that she could have access to credit cards of the guests and accounts of the guests. Right, credit card numbers, CVVs, three digits, uh, identity theft, blackmailing and all the rest. So human trafficking is not conducted by people that just bring in slaves, but from proper criminals, organized crime. And these are the people that we have to deal with, and we have to wake up to this fact and actually be far more careful and try to close these vulnerabilities that we have in terms of um, you know, hiring people, in terms of our own mentality, with regards to the customer can do whatever they like before behind closed doors and uh, about recruitment practices in the sector. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Neshma. I'm from an organization called Shiva Foundation. We are a corporate foundation looking to tackle one slavery and human trafficking in the hotel sector here in the UK. Um, I have a few slides. I'm going to skip over them. I know we're short on time. and. Some of my colleagues have already covered how this manifests in the industry. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we're working with hotel businesses in, in the sector to tackle, tackle this issue. So um, just a bit of background on us as an organization. As I say, we are a corporate foundation founded by the Shiva Hotels Group um, in 2012. Um, it's a small UK-based hotel owner and operator. And for the past three years in particular, we've been working to create a model to tackle non-slavery and human trafficking in the sector. This is the data that Alex already shared with you, so I'll just skip over that. So three, three particular areas that we've identified as risks for the hotel industry are firstly, labor recruitment and sexual exploitation. So as uh, my colleagues mentioned, the hotel sector frequently rely on external staff for cleaning, housekeeping, um, and so there is a risk there, especially with uh, multi-tier recruitment systems. Um, secondly, sexual exploitation. This is perhaps an area that you're more familiar with, so looking at how hotel rooms might be used by traffickers, either transporting victims or for exploitation itself. There was actually a case just a few weeks ago in the news that you might have seen. Um, and finally, supply chain. So goods and services purchased by the hotel, where do they come from? Where does the furniture come from? Where does the food come from? And do we know what the labor practices are in those countries and in those factories? Um, one thing that I wanted to mention that's quite unique for the hotel sector is just the sheer number of stakeholders involved in one property. So you obviously have the hotel that maybe you see when you go traveling, but then you have the brands that you might know and you hear and you see their name on the, on the building. But 
um, a lot of the hotels are not actually operated by the brands themselves. They're franchised out to other companies to operate, and kind of like Shiva, Shiva Hotels. Um, and then an organization like Shiva Hotels might also then hire a management company to manage that hotel, the day-to-day -day operations. Then you have labor providers and recruitment services, so there are a number of stakeholders involved, and sometimes it can get a little bit challenging to know where does the responsibility actually lie. So this is something that we, we decided we want to look at. Um, one thing that I did want to mention is that when we started this work, kind of at the same time when Alex said in 2014, there wasn't much out there for the sector, and it became it was quite a challenge to get businesses to really engage with us on this issue. I think that's changed over the past three or four years, where even investors are asking questions about, okay, what are your policies around one slavery? There's now new legislation like Rebecca shared, and actually businesses have been um, forced to settle in some cases, and some uh, directors have actually got prison time as well. Um, and you will have seen stories in the news every day, so reputational damage has been become a real concern, which it wasn't maybe 10, five, 10 years ago. So how are we looking at this? So hotels have been taking action for some time now. You will have potentially seen um, the International Tourism Partnership Working Group, which has been working with corporate level commitments on human trafficking and other priority areas. Um, there's an organization called Polaris in the US that's working with the Wyndham Group of Hotels and also ECPAT's Code, which looks specifically at child sexual exploitation. However, a key challenge that we found was that a lot of these policies and statements that were being agreed at a corporate level were not filtering down to the operations level. So the general manager, the front half house, the cleaning staff, they didn't know how to spot the signs and if they did spot something suspicious, they didn't know what to do. So that's why we decided to put together a stop slavery blueprint. So just drawing together best practices from the anti-trafficking space and tailoring it to the hotel industry and um, putting that into practice. So we actually created training and guidance for hotel staff at all levels so, and at all departments on how to spot the signs and how to report concerns. We set out steps to identify potential risks in operational supply chains and also purchasing. And we also work closely with the hotels to put in place clear protocols that minimize the risk of one slavery and also make sure that if any victims are identified, they're given the support that they need as soon as possible. Um, and you'll see up there that I've also, we also created an action pack for general managers so that they don't just have this blueprint, but there are clear timelines, checklists, supplementary materials, toolkits that they can practically use on a day-to-day -day basis with their staff and with their heads of departments. Um, the main objective with, with this was really to bring together businesses and NGOs, charities, not two groups that usually work together. And we were trying to make sure that we could create a model that worked with the businesses at minimal at, for the companies at minimal cost, but also went beyond that tick box exercise. So there was an actual impact. Um, this is something we're still assessing, but that was our that's our objective from the beginning. Um, the first hotel to pilot the blueprint was actually the Double Tree by Hilton in Excel, just around the corner. So I don't know if some of you might be staying there. And the general manager sh should be here. I can't see him, but he should be here. So if you have questions on how it's actually working on the ground, you're welcome to, to speak with him. The blueprint is now actually live and being implemented across all six of the Shiva Hotel properties across London and one, one outside of London in New York. And we'll be launching the blueprint and the action pack as well publicly sometime next year for hotels globally really to, to put into practice if they would like. Um, I, did, I think I have some time, so I did want to go through some of what's in the blueprint. Um, so first of all, we worked on a I'm being told I don't have time, so I'm not, I'm not going to um, go through everything. But I did want to say that we do. the first thing that we did as part of this pack was create a public commitment. And you'll see on the slide here that this commitment is actually, is actually displayed in the, um, at the check-in at the hotels on the website and also in some of the TV rooms as well in, in, when um, guests check in. And we've actually got, a, just recently in October, a really positive review from one of the guests of the hotel who are actively looking for things like this and looking for um, an ethical hotel to stay in. So it's not just something that we're doing behind the scenes. Guests are starting to care about, about some of these issues. So it's worth, worth considering from that perspective as well. Um, I'm going to skip over these because I don't have time. 
But the final thing that I, I did want to mention is that working on this blueprint, we actually realized um, we, had to work, we have to work with the industry as a whole. We can't be working on our own. So that's where the Stop Slavery Hotel Industry Network came into play. And the, and the website's up there if you'd like to have a look. Um, so we actually launched we actually launched the network last year at the Trust, uh, Trust Conference, Thomson Reuters Trust Conference. And that's bringing together a range of hotel industry businesses. So we've got the brands, we've got boutique hotel owners, um, management, hotel management, we've got recruitment companies, construction companies all coming together and um, really to process some kind of collaborative industry-wide action. Um, the website actually has a resource hub, so that's quite a good first port of call if you are coming to this issue new and the combat toolkit is on there. And um, next year we'll also be launching a report and a framework that's looking at one specific area, labor exploitation, which uh, my colleague will talk about shortly as well. Um, and yeah, there's more to say, but please come and ask me questions or come speak to me. I'm happy to share more information. And the last slide has my contact details, so feel free to take this down.